Top Med Talk. Well, welcome to Top Med Talk. I'm Desiree Chapel, and we're coming to you from the fifth collaborative clinical trials in anesthesiology meeting here in Prato, Italy. Um, it's been uh, a great two days so far. We're about halfway into our second day, and it's all about big clinical trials going on through the U.S., and it's a big think tank, really, <laughs> of all these individuals that are in- involved. Um, I'm joined by Monty Mythen, who's part of this think tank here, and I think this is his second year at the meeting. Monty, what is your uh, thoughts so far? Well, um, it's just been fantastic. Uh, as I said, second time here. It's run every two years. You know, it's a global endeavor run by Monash University from Melbourne in Australia. Happen to have real estate here in Prato in Italy, just north of Florence. Uh, it's by invitation only. So almost everyone in the room has been active in conducting clinical trials or in communicating clinical trials. It's a very, very special event. We've heard lots of Great uh, results so far, and we can't share them with anyone because they're all embargoed. It's tough. It's really tough, and I'm always worried that what I'm going to say, that I might accidentally say something that's wrong, but good thing it's a podcast because we can cut that out, um, but, which is good. So we've had, uh, we, we sat down and kind of went over day one and some of the, the um, trials that were discussed in day one, and one of those was the balanced uh, balance trial, and um, specifically talking about delirium, and the presenter was Liz Everett, and we've had a chance to sit down with her. She is um, a professor at St. Vincent's Hospital in, in Australia. Liz, thank you for sitting down with us. Thanks very much, Desiree, um, and thanks, Monty, for um, inviting me to, to talk with you today. Liz, we, you know, we just said everything's embargoed, and we know that. We just feel like we're kind of walking on eggshells just a little bit when we would discuss it. But um, can you just give us a little bit about um, maybe the trial design and some of the things that are coming out of and, and uh, you know, some of the things that you can say <laughs> that you t- presented yesterday? One of the things about um, delirium is that there's a lot of work that's that's been looking at uh, depth of anaesthesia and whether or not there might be an impact of depth of anaesthesia on the incidence of delirium. Um, There's been a few studies uh, looking at a targeted BIS compared to routine care, but um, when the BALANCE study was started um, a number of years ago, it um, became an opportunity to look at what the incidence of delirium might be in two groups that were both of targeting a high and a low BIS. So a much more robust comparison because the groups um, are going to, uh, you know, we knew the groups would achieve a good separation. Um, And so we set about setting up a protocol to look at delirium incidence in the randomised controlled um, balanced study. And um, so those groups are targeting a high BIS of 50, so patients with um, relatively light anaesthesia, um, compared to a lower BIS, um, so deeper anaesthesia, um, of 35. Um, And so, you know, that for us was a a perfect opportunity to put some sites on um, who were interested in undertaking the training to assess for delirium so that we could see if there was a difference. Delirium's your thing, right? You're you're kind of an authority in the world right now on on delirium. And so when you were designing this and and looking at this trial, um, I mean, what are some of the rates of delirium right now that in, in that what you were expecting out of the study? In Australia, in our institution, we, we see an incidence of delirium of about 43% following cardiac surgery and about 36% following non-cardiac surgery. So we're talking about a really, you know, a significant um, proportion of patients 65 years and more, or more who uh, end up with an episode or, or more than one episode of delirium um, that we know has long-term complications increased mortality, increased morbidity, uh, increased risk of, of dementia and further cognitive decline. So it's a really important um, poor outcome. And we know that um, there's a possibility to prevent some delirium. So it really is important for us to really start mandating that patients are assessed preoperatively. And I think until we establish clearly Um, what the incidence is and things like perhaps lighter anaesthesia may be protective 
um, in the work that's been done up until now, uh, the, it's, it's equivocal between the, the, the studies that have been done. There's no clear evidence that one, um, that lighter anaesthetic might be more protective um, than deeper anaesthesia. Liz, um, uh, um, we see plenty of delirium, so I'm exposed to it clinically on a regular basis, but I've also had some exposure to the challenges of measuring, quantifying delirium in the patients. How are you able to standardise that in a multi-centre trial and make that measure robust and reliable? So the really um, nice thing about the the tool that we used, which was the three-minute diagnostic CAM tool, confusion assessment method, is that um, it's part of some work that Sharon Anui and Ed Marcantonio have been doing on the um, help um, um, delirium that they've been working on for many, many years. And there's a website where they make available for trial purposes um, and clinical purposes an opportunity to undertake a formal training. So that's done online. There are videos. Um, It meant that we were in a position where we were able to standardise the training that everyone it, no matter which site they were at um, around the world, was undertaking exactly the same training. And we, I centrally scored all of that and fed back to each of the individuals who were training where there was any um, errors, where we needed to repeat any of the training processes. Um, and we, at each site, would have consensus meetings if we were a little concerned about what to ha- you know how the coding should go so the website that has made those that training available is is phenomenal and we couldn't have had a you know that's the only way we were able to have a standardized tr- assessment protocol is that a website available just publicly can anyone use it and, and if it is can you share that with us because i think there are a lot of providers that would be interested in standardizing what they're doing in practice the website is called the hospital elder life program website there are a huge number of resources for healthcare practitioners um, and certainly for patients as well, people who've perhaps experienced an episode of delirium and would like more more information. As far as the training tools are, are um, concerned, you have to apply online through the website in order to be given access to the training videos. Um, Mostly that's um, f- for non-funded or non-sponsored tri- trials. Uh, that they will make those available um, at minimal or no cost. That's a great resource um, to have because a lot of people are trying to do, you know, even smaller studies in um, in the area of delirium and, and cognitive, fun- cognitive dysfunction. And I don't think that I'm overstepping the boundaries because I'm not going to ask you ab- about it specifically. But um, you know, we talk a lot about brain health and, and delirium and associated with. Um, uh, you know, anesthesia. Um, I know that you were just looking at uh, the rates of delirium and the, the level of anesthesia or depth of anesthesia. Um, but were you able to look at other factors that affected, um, you know, hemodynamic management or anything like that? Or are you taking a look at those specific aspects? Uh, so we definitely will be. At this point in time, the results that I presented yesterday um, were very um, pr- preliminary results and just the major, the, the main primary outcome. Uh, but we certainly have um, a large database of information. We will need to go through and look at the, the comorbidities that those patients were experiencing, the, the vulnerabilities that they brought, um, and in particular their baseline cognitive function. is, is a, We know that um, patients who have subtle cognitive impairment are at greater increased risk or greatly increased risk of having an episode of delirium. So um, for for this study, we use the mini mental state examination to assess baseline cognitive function. Um, And we also um, assess that at discharge from hospital. And we used a a, a phone, a a tool that can be used over the phone to measure cognitive function at one year. So all of those factors and then all... As you said, all the um, intraoperative factors, um, the level of vasopressors used, pain, how many opioids the patients got, um, whether or not any of them had benzodiazepines, um, and certainly all the hemodynamic variables in the intraoperative period will be taken into account. Relatively recently, was published as, as was touched on in the presentation, was the Engages trial, which is a 
as I understand it, a single centre US trial that has some, superficially has some subtle differences, but as you get into it, has some really quite marked differences in trial design. Could you just comment for a moment on that? One of the major differences uh, with the Engages trial is that they uh, only assessed delirium once daily and they did that in the afternoon, whereas for the balanced sub-study we assessed delirium twice daily um, uh, in the morning and in the evening. So the assessment of delirium relies to some extent on the tool that you use and the frequency of your assessments. Um, so uh, we did both use the same tool. The Engages study uses the, used the 3D CAM, the, the, same, the same that we did, um, the same as we did. Um, uh, in the other aspects that may or may not be different that I am uh, at this point in time unaware of in our data because I, I haven't been through the data thoroughly but one of the I, I think in my opinion the concerns about the Engages trial is that both groups had periods of time where there was burst suppression and both groups had periods of time where the BIS was below 40 so talking about both pa both patients in both groups being exposed to birth suppression and really deep anaesthesia. And what we don't know at this point is whether there is a threshold for those things. Is a little bit of birth suppression okay, but a lot not okay? Or is the fact that you're in birth suppression at all a problem? Um, and that's what we'll be looking at with the, the data that we have. Excited to see those results. Do, when do you think those are going to be uh, coming out in your estimation? We would hope to get this published by the end of this year, certainly. Um, I would hope. So, yeah. Good luck <laughs> on that. Um, Liz, I know we need to get back into the, the next session, but um, I was dying to ask, I know you participated in the BJA, the British Journal of Anesthesia's Women's Symposium here in Prado a couple days ago. And I know there was a lot of good conversation that came from the meeting. Um, I, I just kind of wanted to get your take on it. I know that you were going to participate in a panel and they kind of ran short on time. Um, but what, did, what was your kind of big takeaway from, uh, from the symposium and this gathering of women? Thanks, Desiree. It was a really interesting meeting. Um, it was great to have some really empowered, um, high-achieving women um, presenting to us. I guess the thing that I find uh, really important about that is how, how aware we need to be about my, any sort of minority group and, and making sure that um, we pick the best person for the role, whatever that might be, a job, a promotion, speaking at a conference, um, no matter who that who that person is um, and so if that's a woman is the best person for the job then that's great and that should be how we um, how we move forward I think um, but taking into account all sorts of minority groups people that sometimes you don't know what people's backgrounds are and we talked a bit about that on Tuesday afternoon that um, we see people um, at the level they're at, they've achieved all these wonderful things and sometimes you just don't realise where people have come from and, and what sort of um, uh, discrimination that they have been um, f have faced in order to get to where they are. The sort of bar, I wasn't at the session, arrived a little bit late, but the bar chatter is, is quite mixed about the... Um, they all agree with that it's an important issue and it needs discussing, but there's quite a spectrum of opinions from people. Did, I mean, did anyone play devil's advocate in the session or was it, was it possibly loaded one way? I felt it was a bit loaded one way. Um, as Desiree said, there was meant to be a panel um, and I was um, gearing myself up to play devil's advocate. I think we need to be really careful that we don't end up with tokenism. We need to make sure that women are uh, appointed to promotions or um, get invited to speak at major conferences because um, they're the right person for the job, um, not just because they're a woman. I think we need to be really careful that we're applauding women for the right reasons. We've had two female prime ministers in modern times in the United Kingdom, and both of them have been taken down by the predominantly male uh, colleagues around them. Do you think there's any messaging there? Or am I reading too much into that? Wow, really interesting. <laughs> Next we'll be on to religion. Um, <laughs> 
politics. Um, uh, look, <laughs> in my opinion, and I'm not the greatest with uh, the world of, of politics. I'm not the greatest with Australian politics. Um, but I think uh, I think that would be reading too much into it. I think that both of the UK um, prime ministers who've been women have been in their positions for a long time and have um, been very powerful. I've only felt like a collaborative relationship in a lot of the, in everything that I've done and been very supported very well by women and men. And I think going forward, that's always important to kind of look at that aspect. I mean, you're always going to look at the people that didn't want to, you know, didn't want you to succeed or was, they were discriminating you against you, but there are so many more people that are usually for us as women or a diverse, you know, a diverse group. So. Yeah, look, I, I completely agree with that. I've been incredibly fortunate in my career to be given in amazing opportunities by by women and men um, around me and I've been fortunate to be in such a supportive environment for my um, my career. You've done amazing things Liz. Congratulations on all the work that you've been doing that you've done and been doing and that I know that you're going to be looking at and continuing to do um, and I think uh, you know that's a, it's a good message. Um, for sure. So thank you so much for taking the time to sit down. Um, I also wanted to make a plug that um, we just had some lectures that went out on Top Med Talk a couple weeks ago on Sunday special on the um, perioperative SIG or shared interest group meeting that you presented on um, perioperative cognitive uh, dysfunction. And it's a fantastic series. So I please encourage everyone to take a listen and uh, hopefully we can talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Top Med Talk. Nate Majerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out Top Med Talk. Com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. Finally, Top Med Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, Evidence-Based Perioperative Medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on Top Med Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.